I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, What's Happening with Human Rights Around Our World on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. Today, we're looking at no arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile, Article 9, freedom from all in our world. And we're joined by an amazing advocate who works with Amnesty International, who is the Regional Development Director. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights guarantees everyone on Earth deserves not being subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile. And the UDHR Article 9 guarantees no unfair detainment for those defending our collective democracy and individual dignity. Adede, can you share with us a bit on why this issue is so important in international human rights law? Sure. Thank you for having me. The importance of this is that not only is it about individual dignity at the very core essence of it, in other words, what happens to us as individuals, but it's also a critical uh, protection for people who are ensuring that the other right, that the rights of others to behave in a free and, and dignified manner are being protected. So, for example, if you were arrested, say, for um, uh, uh, taking on a case or or making a, a, a human rights declaration, and I was defending you, and then I was detained, not only would my rights be violated, but also your ability to get protection and to get representation would also be undermined. So it has a, a cascading effect, which then creates a whole undermining of civil society and respect for human rights. It's really true. It kind of is that the beginning thread. And if you start pulling it, you can see how everything that keeps us warm and makes the world a welcoming place in this rule of law would actually unravel without that. Can you also share a bit on how this right is central and core to the global arena in the world that we face today? Yes. Um, well, I, I first I'd like to point out that um, this right was actually the, for, the founding principle of our organization, Amnesty International. Um, in 1960, 61, there were uh, two students uh, who, who were simply toasting freedom uh, in Lisbon, Portugal, during the Salazar administration at a bar. I mean, how threatening could that be? And they were detained and arrested. And that led uh, to um, the lawyer, Peter Benison, our founder, basically saying this was unacceptable. But at the moment, I would argue that this fundamental freedom of not being arbitrarily arrested, detained, or exiled is basically um, being challenged and undermined by the rise of authoritarian governments in various parts of the world, um, the restrictions uh, uh, that are placed in terms of uh, trying to crush pro-democracy uh, activists or just human rights activists or even journalists. So in other words, it, it's a critical um, threat to the flow of information and the flow of information is essential to people knowing what's going on and of course what they can do about it. And I think that this is why we, we, we see the use of detention rising in many places. Um, this is why governments are using, you know, they, they, they use trumped up charges or they will sometimes not even bother charging people, with it, but they'll just hold them. Um, uh, and, and their hope is that they will wear people down or just make people forget them. And that by doing that, you can basically silence uh, the uh, scrutiny of your behavior or people challenging your policies. No, I really appreciate you bringing up that example of the, the spark that really lit the candle for Amnesty International. And it's one of the traditions we do at the end of one of the trainings that we always get to have that toast uh, to freedom. And it, it's that most basic thing that you described. It could be as innocent as students toasting freedom and then having those rights. But then it is exciting how it inspires others to take action as well because we understand how all of our rights are interconnected. And if anyone's rights are challenged, then all of our rights are threatened as well. One thing that always inspires me is when you look about how people get involved, can you share with me a bit about what first inspired you to care about this issue and some of the first campaigns you were involved in? Absolutely. The, uh, the, the human connection that you refer to is so fundamentally powerful. Um, it, it, it makes a distant country or a, an issue real, um, especially when you can say um, this individual is just like me. Um, they're not um, some powerful person or they're not, you know, um, so 
uh, different, that they don't deserve to be able to express themselves in a nonviolent manner without, with, with, with complete freedom. In other words, how would you like to be treated? How would I like to be treated? Um, that was certainly a core um, draw for me when I joined Amnesty back in 1994, that we, what we were doing as an organization was not only personalizing human rights, but we were also personalizing the response because what we have done is basically taken the, the, these cases of people being arbitrarily arrested and detained and turning them into challenges or opportunities for people to engage in and work in solidarity for people they may never meet or, or, or may never uh, you know, be able to, to, to have a conversation with. Um, that, that, that work has been core to the organization and been so, so important to me um, that I, I think when I think of the, the, the time working here, I can think of you know, big campaigns, which are an amalgamation of individual cases. And I could also think of individual campaigns. One, one of the first ones that I, I, I would refer to would be that of Ken Sarawiwa and the Ogoni Nine. These were uh, Nigerian environmental activists who uh, were detained and then eventually executed by uh, uh, General Sani Abacha, who was the uh, military dictator at the time in the, 19, in the late 1990s. And, you know, they had done nothing. They were framed for the murder of four chiefs. Um, but their, their mistake was that they had basically said that shell oil was in polluting, um, not only polluting their environment, but also was colluding with the government to basically intimidate and harass people in that region. And I think that that campaign really crystallized the link between the environment and rights it crystallized the focus on the role of multinational oil corporations, in some cases, um, in a very, very negative light. And it also, I think, birthed many, many new activists who were like, um, you know what, um, we cannot continue doing business as usual and filling up our the tanks of our cars when these companies are doing such terrible human rights violations. That was one case, I think, that really came to mind um, as one of, you know, the one that, that shaped me. Um, there are some others, I think, that are known to many people. Aung San Suu Kyi, of course, was a longtime amnesty prisoner of conscience. And, and, and that is a categorization that we have for some of these individual cases of detention. Um, but uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, I think you probably remember Rabia Kadir, uh, who was, a, a, you know, the Uyghur businesswoman. Um, and in those cases, we actually got to meet them when they were released. And, you, you, you know, it, people say human rights work is, is very, very hard. And it, you have your victories far and few between. But when you do, and when you meet someone like a Rabia Kadir or even an Aung San Suu Kyi, it makes, a, it makes an impact on you. You suddenly realize that there is something that has been strengthened inside yourself just by working on that case uh, and meeting that individual. And they, and they literally will tell you, thank you. Um, you know, the postcards made a difference. The, the letters made a difference. Just knowing that there were people paying attention probably saved my life or saved me from being tortured. That, that's an excellent example and definitely a walk down memory lane for me as well. I remember writing my first letters in college with Amnesty International and sending them off. And then being at a training, I think it was, it was focusing at the area coordinator, but also the one for experts on specific countries. And yes. then to meet a person who I had wrote the letter for and actually see them in person. And it brings tears to your eyes when they say, your letter made that difference. I am free today because of you. And that was unbelievable. And then now, as you mentioned, Rabia, also writing letters for her, and then later being able to assist her in Geneva during the Universal Periodic Review of China and working on speeches with her and seeing China still trying to manipulate even the UN human rights mechanisms to not allow her to come into uh, the Palais de Nation and work with her. So even once we get them released, it continues. And then your example of Ken Sarwiwa, that was one of the greatest experiences when I was at that point just the area coordinator and we created that resolution 
that then created the Just Earth campaign between Sierra Club and Amnesty. And those first campaigns, the, the meetings in Minnesota with indigenous peoples and connecting environment and human rights, which all of us knew were interconnected, but had not seen that really diligent, determined campaign. And that was exciting to host those first couple of meetings between Amnesty, Sierra Club, and of course, Ken Sarwiwa. I remember working with the UN PO, Unrepresented Nations and People's Organization, and later yeah. working with Owens Wiwa. His brother was a medical doctor uh, on Maui and still raising the issues here with Shell in Hawaii. And it really is so much that has happened. And the way you put it, that people are thinking about filling up their gas tank and the consequences and connecting those dots and showing how we're all in a way complicit, but we all can be catalysts for change. That yeah. really does remind me of even Myanmar and the struggle today as all those people are seeing a tide turning and able to hopefully one day be able to achieve what Aung San Suu Kyi had dedicated her life to. So it is exciting. And it's even during COP when you talked about it, that issue is on the negotiation table that's in the global stock take based on the Paris Agreement. So it is exciting to see what you were talking about, those drops of knowledge, those drops of determination, being able to now shape international instruments and institutions. Well, and I think um, one of the other things that, you know, I, I would also say is that um, casework around individual detention is, is, is bipartisan is too small, but you, but it's something that when there's an individual and you, and people re learn the story of what they've done and, and how unfairly they're being treated there, it actually does break down barriers. Um, one of the things um, that I know you, you've been involved in, of course, is with the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission in Congress, which is a bipartisan congressional body in the House of Representatives that just works on human rights. One of the strongest projects that they've done is called Defending Freedoms. And it is literally about pairing a member of Congress with a case of um, a prisoner of conscience. And, and uh, it has proven to be incredibly powerful because it allows constituents to develop a relationship with the member of Congress. It allows the member of Congress to become a champion for that individual. And it, you know, it can go from making a statement like, oh, I'm thinking about so-and-so today who is still in jail to sponsoring a resolution to even visiting the country and demanding to go and visit that person. In, in other words, it's flexible what people can do. Um, and it also begins a, the journey, which of course is fundamental about learning about the issue. In other words, um, working on the case of, 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 of an individual will teach you why is that individual at risk? What are they fighting for? And why is it important to change the larger context? And I think that that's fundamental to human rights work. That's why these cases are so important. That really is an excellent example. And Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, that's crucial. Because just recently, the new representative from Hawaii and the, the second district, uh, Jill Takuda, agreed to join the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission and participate. And, and that's due to the great work of Ben Chow um, to be able to say why this is important. And as you're describing that, it's also good to look at the Senate because the Senate has created that new Human Rights Caucus and Senator Maisie Hirono has also signed on as well. So it's great to see Hawaii of our four members having two of them act actively engaging in this process. And as you said, there's a whole array of advocacy tools that's possible that they can sharpen. It's a speech on the floor, it's a letter, it's a congressional visit, and it's also exciting when we see what we can do. I know there's the Right for Rights campaign. Can you share a bit how everyday people can either participate through Amnesty International or participate by adopting and working with prisoners of conscience to show how valuable this important right is? Absolutely. Um, and it's a wonderful showing from your uh, congressional leadership and being engaged like that. That's wonderful. A tribute to all of you. Um, so you, you refer to something called Right for Rights, which is an annual campaign uh, that the, our movement does globally. So it's not just here in the United States. It's literally every member of Amnesty International between um, the end of October and the end of January 
um, all work on the, the same 10 cases, um, sometimes 12, sometimes 15, 14. But these are cases that are from all over the world. They cover all sorts of different individuals and sometimes um, communities um, that, that may be facing a risk. The organization will uh, de develops what we call a toolkit so that you have background information, you have um, model letters that you can use or model postcards that you can you can write for yourself, or you can click and 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 send send them electronically. Um, but what we do is basically try to maximize pressure to get <clears throat> um, traction on these ten cases. Now, of course, as we said, the, the ten cases are indicative of a larger human rights issue and so they're educational tools as well and um, you can you can take part in this anywhere you can take part in it as a group um, by organizing an event yourself or by locating a local amnesty chapter or you can go to the uh, amnesty usa website www.amnestyusa.org and click um, on the right for rights tab um, and you can the the, the 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 different cases are there along with the different letters and you can personalize them and um it you know it sounds too neat and too easy maybe or it sounds like a, what kind of impact is this going to have and and yet it does um we have had people released because of right to rights cases because you you you've got to remember that you're not just one voice you're part of 40 or 50 countries where amnesty members are sending letters on that same individual. Now, just think of what it would be like to be sitting there and suddenly you, your inbox crashes because everybody that you can think of is writing to you about the person that you are detaining. Or um, or in some cases, you're, you're suddenly your mailbox, uh, your mailman shows up with a bag of 500 letters, 600 letters. Um, I remember this wonderful um, activist, Dr. Taye. He was uh, a member of the Ethiopian Teachers Federation um, who was uh, jailed for about six years. And when he was finally released, he came to the United States and he said he always knew before um, an amnesty campaign that there was a campaign because the guards would come and tell him you're your friends are making noise again, or and and he, you know, he was removed. He was moved from solitary confinement to a regular cell. His treatment improved, and and you know, he said, you cannot overestimate how important those changes are because everything about detention um, is to break you, and and if they if you think that you're alone. Then it's much easier for them to break you, and that, and I, I remember that. So, taking part in the Right for Rights campaign um, during this period is very fun. It's it's exciting, but you can do that throughout the year because we also have an Individuals at Risk network um, where you can also find information, and those go on throughout the year. Um, and you can form, as I said, you can find groups in your region. Um, or in your town, and you might be able to do some things together with them so that, you know, it, it, it does not have to be a huge operation, but it can also be as creative as you want it to be. No, it's, a, it's an excellent tool, and it reminds me of the, I just got one yesterday from Canada, and it actually goes back sort of to what we're looking at with the UN Framework Commission on Climate Change. It's looking at two elders from Torres Strait Islands of Australia and talking about rising sea level. And, and it's important to fill and build on the case they brought to the UN Human Rights Committee under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But it's exciting to see how amnesty has also really evolved. I remember when you couldn't work on your own country under WUK, I was mainly civil and political rights, but really that evolution to include economic, social, and cultural, civil and political. Can you share how amnesty, have you seen it change in the positive transformation to really make a difference in the world as a global movement. Oh, uh, you, you're so right. I mean, the organization that you and I joined um, has, 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 has evolved and it had to. Um, I think one of the, the biggest things was, you know, everybody thinks of anyone who knows about Amnesty will think, oh, it's, it's an organization that started in, in the United Kingdom and it's based in the United Kingdom. Well, it still has a large chunk of staff in the United Kingdom, but 
um, in the 2000s, it decentralized and it has set up research and campaigning offices uh, in, in different locations around the world. And that's been incredibly important to not only become a real genuine member of civil society in those regions, but also to have more diverse staff and partners so that the organization really is not, no longer a quote unquote Western human rights organization. That was one thing. The, the next big thing which you already referred to is this work on e ESCR, economic, social, and cultural rights, um, which is, a, you know, has basically enabled us to work on evictions and housing. It's enabled us to work on climate and, and economics. Um, it's enabled us to work on access to health. Um, and arguably even um, abortion rights can be seen as an ESCR, e ESCR issue amongst others. Um, the organization I think has had, has learned um, that even discussions about conditions for elections, which was also a taboo, you may remember, we, we, we said, you know, no elections, no politics, nothing, we're just human rights. And a lot of our partners said, that doesn't make sense. You know, you, 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 you can't ignore the political context and how it drives human rights violations. And that's changed. And it's, it, it's, it's changed in other parts of the world and it's influencing how the whole organization approaches um, the ability to campaign, the ability to speak freely, the ability to be in opposition and not be detained. Um, or beaten up or intimidated. Um, and it's coming also, it's changing the way we do work here in the United States. Um, but I, I think I would just say that the work on the environment has probably been the most powerful um, uh, evidence of this evolution. Um, you know, we, we, many of the abuses that we work on and the people who are being detained are as a result of climate change injustice or climate change um, induced poverty and competition and conflict. And you can't just take care of the symptoms. You have to address the root cause. And that's changing climate policy. <laughs> and uh, so I think that, 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 that that's really exciting. And I, and I, 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 I suspect the organization will continue to evolve, um, you know, because human dignity has to manifest itself in so many different ways and it has to be protected. Um, as creatively as possible. And maybe you can share, because as you described that example, it reminded me of the annual general membership meeting in San Diego and that powerful panel on abortion as a human right. Maybe you can share what the AGM is and how that functions and how Amnesty makes decisions to make a difference. Yes. Um, so the AGM, the annual general meeting, uh, happens usually in February every year. It literally is uh, what it says, a, a meeting of Amnesty members, but also it's open to the public. Um, and there are, are, are panels, um, different discussion groups and caucuses to discuss the whole range of the organization's business from specific cases or a particular crisis in a region um, to, you know, how do you organize yourself and a, and a group in a high school? You know, what are the skill sets that you need and what are the resources? You know, it, 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 it really is a, um, a marketplace also of ideas. Like uh, so many of these AGMs are where people decide, well, why don't we try this? And someone will say, yes, no, uh, do it this way. And then suddenly three months later, you've got a, a wonderful, successful campaign that's happening in, in a number of different places. Um, the next one is going to be in Washington, D.C., and it's going to be followed by what we call a lobby day, where me Amnesty members will be able to go up and meet their congressional representatives to talk to them about human rights concerns. And that's also something that evolved, uh, you know, with the organization. In, in the past, Amnesty did not do anything beyond basic interaction with the U.S. government. But now we've realized that you need to have human rights champions in the government to keep the U.S. government accountable, but also to keep the U.S. as a force for human rights. And so we do lobbying 
we train people, we give them materials, we help them organize the meetings. And then, you know, um, we, we, we basically say, go and have a good meeting. And remember, you're, you're cultivating a relationship. So those are the kinds of things that people can do. And you, of course, you can learn more on the website, you know, www.amnestyusa.org. Or, you know, for those of you in Hawaii, you can find Josh, who is an, uh, a savant and a mentor for many of us. Um, uh, and and find out how you can get involved. But we we are we're in some very difficult difficult times right now, and this is when we need to come together and hold each other up and take care of each other. And um, working on this particular human rights issue of detention and exile and um, is is so fundamental. But it's just the start, and it can lead to so much more. So. Um, looking forward to helping and answering any other questions that might come up later but this is great to have this discussion no it's it's really powerful because it reminds of, of all the different ways that people participate in it's that flame of freedom and it's quite like a muscle and if we don't exercise our democracy muscle and we don't get involved in politics then bad things usually happen and so as you describe that it also shows why the UDHR is such a powerful tool because it outlines those opportunities for a new way forward for our world. And Article 9 serves as that valuable vision rooted in the rule of law with basic rights and fundamental freedoms, ensuring those freedoms and dignity for all. Maybe in the final moment, you can share with us a bit of your vision for the future of this right and potential paths to respect, protect, and fulfill these rights on the ground and around our planet. Sure. I think that the that arbitrary detention needs to be exposed for what it is, which is um, not the prerogative of government, as a, but it's a violation that governments cannot be allowed to get away with. I think in too many parts of the world, people assume that the governments have the right to detain you and then answer questions later. Um, that until we, we 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 change that fundamental orientation we're, we're, we're going to be playing defense and 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 that is not where we want to stay um we have a wonderful human rights education program that is um developing learning learning tools and modules for people to use and is also training amnesty members to to be trainers you know we um because that's not only how we tilt the balance in terms of orientation but it's also how we build the movement because if people don't feel like they have the right to speak and to speak freely, um, then they're always going to accept constraints. And that is exactly what we need to change. So building on our human rights education work, working in partnership with, with more impacted communities and other organizations, I think are going to be fundamental. Um, and I think that that's what we're trying to do now. And of course, continuing to evolve to have a full spectrum of human rights um, but I, 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 I'm optimistic that the organization is going to continue to play a, a critical role, but it, we, we, we need to up our game here in the United States as well as domestically. That's really so succinct, but so sincere because it's countering a culture of fear, but then cultivating that culture of conscience and courage and compassion for one another. And that really summarizes Article 9 that recognizes everyone's everywhere is entitled to those basic rights, and no one should be subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile. And also the Royal Amnesty International has done as a champion for core values and a voice for people around the planet. Mahalo, Arate, it's so good to see you. I'll never forget coming out of COVID and seeing you in DC on Capitol Hill, reminded me that the world was all coming back to normal again. And it was great to reunite with you because I had never been two years away from you uh, during any period of time for around the last decade. And I've always admired your work on Capitol Hill for many people around the planet. Mahalo.